Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Kunganisha Ministries, and we're going to be looking at our Bible study from the last week, which was looking at the chapter of Luke 15. So we start with verses 1 to 7, the parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? But when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So we just look at that passage now in a little bit more detail. Jesus' message has been one of repentance and this can be very challenging for many people. People do not like to accept that they have done and still do wrong. And yet tax collectors and sinners were all gathering to hear the words of Jesus. So his message was obviously engaging quite a few people. Unfortunately, not the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who saw themselves as righteous. They, decided, they divided society between the clean and the unclean and didn't approve of Jesus as he mixed with the unclean. In Matthew 9, we see how Jesus called a tax collector named Levi. He called him to him, and Levi became one of Jesus' disciples. This disciple actually changed his name to Matthew, the Gospel writer. And in Matthew 9, verses 13, he writes, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So we see, excuse me, Jesus is saving the lost souls. Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the lost sheep. Throughout scripture, there is written much about shepherds and sheep. And sheep have a tendency to wander. And when they get lost, they don't have the ability to find their flock again. They need the help and guidance of a shepherd. When the shepherd finds a lost sheep, he rejoices and celebrates. Much the same way God rejoices when the lost are found, when a lost soul comes back to God. Jesus is a good shepherd who brings the lost back to God. And as disciples in Christ, as his hands and feet now, we are called to bring back the lost um, to God through Jesus Christ. And when we do that, let there be much rejoicing and celebration. We now look at verses 8 to 10, a very short verse, the parable of the lost coin. Well, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In this passage, we see a woman searching for a lost coin. In the previous passage, we saw a shepherd who went searching for a lost sheep, which was one of a hundred. The woman here has ten silver coins and loses one, so perhaps the search was a bit more desperate. If she was a widow with no sons, then any lost money would be a problem for her because she is unlikely to have an income. So this coin is indeed precious to her. See the delight she has when she finds it. She asks her friends and neighbours to rejoice with her. This, of course, is a parable. Jesus tells his story to make a point. And here we see that the lost coin represents a lost soul. God isn't lost. It isn't the soul. It isn't the souls that are lost. It is the souls that are lost 
he still claims he still has claims to them but the sheep and the coin cannot find their way back to their the owner it needs help and lost souls need jesus god came to find the lost through his son jesus christ and celebrated when the souls were indeed saved and now he has you and me to have soul such to save souls and again we celebrate when we find them also note that the shepherd searched and found one lost sheep the woman too found one lost coin if we ever saved one lost soul it will be it, it will still be cause for god to celebrate so if we only ever find one lost soul god will celebrate that we now look at 11 to 16 and we're starting to look at over three passages the story of the prodigal son and here we're looking at the prodigal son taking his father's inheritance jesus continued there was a man who had two sons the younger one said to his father father give me my share of the estate so he divided his property between them not long after that the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living after he spent everything there was a severe famine in that whole country and he became in need so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything in today's world it is dominated by materialism people succumb to this materialistic nature of today's society as they want what the world has to offer and they want it now they want instant gratification in today's passage we see a son ask his father for his share of his father's inheritance the father accepts his son's request and the son goes and squanders it all on prodigal living but the money runs out and it falls out at a time of hardship in today's world people are wanting what is on offer uh, materialistically and the advertising world exploits this they tempt people they force feed their desires and it obviously works as people fall into debt having satisfied these desires and quite often today the instant gratification comes from the likes of drugs and alcohol and sex and these can cause addiction for many people the need to satisfy their cravings becomes so great that they steal and fraudulently manipulate people in order to get what they want we see the son in this passage as the villain in the piece but at least he was gone he had gone about obtaining his inheritance in an honest way he simply asks his father for it the father knows what his younger son is likely to do with the inheritance that he will squander it but the son has free will and his father allows his son to exercise that free will such was his love for his son our father in heaven loves us too so much so that he gives us free will and we have an inheritance waiting for us a place in the kingdom of heaven which will last an eternity if we choose to walk away from our father and succumb to the temptations of the world we too are ex exercising our free will but we also could be at risk of squandering our inheritance now we look at chapters 17 to 24 and i call this the prodigal son of the return when he came to his senses he said how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here i am starving to death i will set out and go back to my father and say to him father i have sinned against he against heaven and against you i am no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired servants so he got up and went to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him he ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him the son said to him father 
I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. So they began to celebrate. There are many people who, uh, in this world who will testify that they've been in dire straits, even to the point of suicide, but then Jesus stepped in and saved their lives. They have lost everything, either through circumstance or more often than not, extra extravagant and sinful living. But God touches them in some way and they realise that life can be so different. In our passage today, which continues on from the earlier passage, we see the younger son recognises the desperate plight he has fallen into and repents of the extravagant life, lifestyle he had previously succumbed to, courtesy of his father's inheritance. He knows that his behaviour has been wrong, he has been sinful, and he has gone against his father's wishes, and now he faces the consequences. He is working probably outside his country for someone who doesn't even pay him for pods to eat. He is treated worse than the pigs he is looking after, which would be even more demeaning considering he was a Jew and the pigs were seen as unclean animals. The answer lay with his father and he was prepared to forsake his position as son and become like one of the hired servants. In the Jewish society at this time, Slaves were treated almost as part of the family, but hired servants could be hired and released at any time. He was prepared to be one of these servants just to be close to his father again. Jesus, Jesus came to serve and not be served. How prepared are we to be servants in order to experience God's closeness? As, like the te testimonies mentioned, mentioned earlier, the answer to all our predicaments lie with our Father, it lies with God. Like the son in the parable, we must recognise our wrongdoings, repent and turn to our Father. When we focus not on our troubles, but on God through Jesus Christ, life changes. So many people share testimonies of a new life in Jesus, and this is what we can expect too when we focus on, G on him. Jesus did say that life won't be easy when we place our faith in him, but focusing on Christ enables us to see the positives, which gives us hope and belief in troubled times. And look what happens to the son when he returns to his father. An unbelievable welcome with his father running to him, and much celebrations follow because his son was lost and has now been found. And our final passage, which concludes the prodigal son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has, have, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and you have never, have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So looking at episode three of the parable of the prodigal son, the older son is now introduced and we can see that he is not happy that his younger brother has returned. And despite him having squandered his inheritance, his return causes much celebration. 
I'm sure there are many who can understand the oldest bro older brother's disgruntlement. He has been faithful and loyal to his father and has obeyed him completely. And yet he has never had the opportunity even to have a small party with friends. But this attitude is self-centered, feeling sorry for oneself, and not looking fully at the circumstances. The father explains that his older son still has inheritance to come. He is blessed with all that he still has, but he is forgetting these blessings, instead focusing on what he feels to be an injustice, an injustice that takes, he takes personally. The older son is far from being close to his father because he is not understanding the joy his father has at the return of his younger son. We have all fallen short of God's expectations of us, and yet when we recognise this and return to him, he celebrates. We receive his amazing grace. When other people return to God, we must remember this grace that God has given to us. It is very easy to think that somebody else's sin is greater than ours, but that is not how God sees it. A sin is a sin, and yet God celebrates every returning son or daughter. If we cannot be joyous too, then can we really say we are close to God? Can we really say that we know God when we don't feel the same joy that he feels? Sometimes when we feel that we have cause to celebrate, our joy can be tempered if we feel that somebody close doesn't share that joy, that they are hurting in some way. That person suffering the hurt might say, you go on, go and enjoy yourself. But <clears throat> we know we can't fully enjoy ourselves knowing that this person, for whatever reason, cannot celebrate with us. Some of the joy has gone. Likewise, in order for God to celebrate joyously the return of his lost son, he needs all his children to celebrate alongside him. I place before you a scenario. Somebody you know who has done much harm in your community decides to turn his or her life around. They repent of their wrongdoings and turn to Christ. They start to come to the church you attend. Do you snub them because of their past or do you welcome them because of their future? The story of the prodigal son is a parable that Jesus tells. The one thing we are never told in scripture is if the older son does eventually come to the party in joyous celebration. We can complete this story by ensuring that we do celebrate the return of every lost soul. Let us pray. Dear Father, our amazing God, we are heartily sorry we, if we at times have not celebrated the return of a lost child in the way that you do. Help us not to be self-centred, but to feel your joy and to party with you also. Amen. <laughs>